It's like the chrysalis of a butterfly. My friend saw a butterfly coming out of chrysalis when she was on a hike and she was so excited. So she started thinking that she was helping the butterfly by ripping a bit of the chrysalis so that the butterfly could come out easier. And her friend was like, oh no, you've killed the butterfly because every moment of the tearing and the pushing and the struggling in the chrysalis helps the wing strengthen. And so by her tearing the chrysalis and allowing the wing to come out, that wing will be lame and the butterfly won't be able to fly. And so it's really interesting because the society we're looking at is kind of like our chrysalis and like we need to break through and all the steps we take to figure out how to struggle out of this will make us into who can exist outside of the chrysalis. This is the Conscious Economics Podcast and I'm your host, Rhiannon Roseland. This is the place where we explore people, planet, profit, and art through the lens of the new economy. If you're interested in changing yourself, getting more creative, or changing the system at large, then this is the podcast for you. Tune in every other week as we explore these topics with amazing guests. We'll go deep, we'll go heart-centered and soul-felt as we go into how we change ourselves and change the world. What's up, everyone? It's Rhiannon here, and we have another episode of Conscious Economics. I'm apologizing straight up right now because I sound awful. I know that. I have a cold. It's not as bad as it sounds. So I'm just obviously sitting here at home recording this intro for you. Don't worry, I wasn't sick when the episode was recorded. So just kind of bear with me. But we have such an amazing episode for you today. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about the incredible social change artist, new economy leader that we interviewed here. So Connie Lim, artist named Milk, is a recording artist, writer, producer, and artivist, she says, but I call her a social change artist, um, who is known for her powerful anthems that have become the soundtracks to grassroots movements all over the world. So her song Quiet is known as the unofficial anthem of the Global Women's March, which as you probably remember, kind of happened in conjunction with the Me Too movement. And it's been listed as Billboard's number one protest song of the year, that year that it went viral. And it's an official selection on the NPR's American Anthem series. Um, So her music has been translated into multiple languages by choirs all over the world. And she's got to share stages with some of the most relevant leaders of our time due to the fact that she's mixing her own music with these important social change issues. Issues. So she's actually shared stages with the likes of Oprah, Jason Mraz, Yoko Ono, Amanda Gorman, Michelle Obama, Annie DeFranco. She's just an unbelievable unbelievable person, artist, activist, producer. She's starting to write songs for other artists as well now, working on an album I think that was released last year. I'm I'm not exactly sure for John Legend. So she was working on some cuts for that album, which is really amazing. And I know she's done some continued collaboration with John Legend, which is pretty fantastic. I actually met Milk when we were hosting Michelle Obama in Toronto for her first speech on Canadian soil after leaving the White House. And um, she came and opened up the session with her song, Quiet. Just gave me so many chills. I could tell I loved her energy from the moment I met her. And then we've been doing collaborations through Conscious Economics um, and Lunar Studios ever since. So I really do, even though I don't get to spend a lot of time with her in person, she's in LA, I'm in Toronto. I really do consider her somebody who really inspires me. And every time that we have a conversation, I feel like we're sharing this vibrational frequency of the new economy and just passing back these little gems of wisdom that we're learning from digging within ourselves and finding out, you know, how to manage our own healing journey. And this conversation, it's so powerful. So we talk about everything from her being an activist and an artist to how she's really uh, transitioned through the music industry and is approaching it in a very different way. I would say a more conscious economy way. Um, We talk about aging, we talk about body image, we talk 
talk about just growing and depth and healing and all of those beautiful things and and what it really means to be an artist, managing money, understanding our role and our value in the economy. It's a beautiful episode and she is a beautiful, beautiful artist, activist, and soul. So I'm just going to let you jump right into it. Enjoy this episode with Connie Lim, otherwise known as Milk. Hello, and how are you, and what in the Hi. world is going on over there? <laughs> so good to see you. I was so it's excited so for this. It's going well. It's been There's been so many transitions, I'm sure, for everyone in the world, but personal life is really grounding and stabilizing, and then career is transitioning and morphing, or music is, and I continue to just like love the craft, so I continue to like show up and and just find new ways. Like it's just songwriting inspires me to adapt in so many ways because I love it so much. So I'm yeah. so, I mean, the last time that you and I messaged, you were kind of talking or alluding to this very large transformation. And and like you said, I think all of us collectively are going through that. Like that's definitely our systems are, you know, transforming our relationships with each other and ourselves are transforming. But then like it got really material for like my mom passed away on December 3rd, which was huge. And... I know, but it's so interesting and it was funny that I'm having this call with you today or this talk with you because I just had like another shift in in perspective this morning. During my morning practice, I've been going in and out of the waves of grief and like grief will take you in all sorts of places and paths and I was really reflecting on like okay, like mothering myself through this and like how do I mother myself through this and like how do I become, you know, the mother now and like how do I embody, like I am now the matriarch of my family, like there's everyone's gone and it's just like this really interesting transformation that's quite literal, but it's also on so many levels. It's sort of what we're all being called to do right now is like come back to our relationship with our own self-nurturing abilities or like how can we nurture ourselves through these transitions in career? How can we nurture ourselves through these transitions in society or relationship? And like how can we mother ourselves better? Because even if we've been mothered, we've been motherless. We've been like disconnected from the planet, disconnected from parts of ourselves. And that's like that whole toxic kind of economy and toxic culture that feeds us all of this. And what I'm getting all around to is that you are somebody who really embodies that for me. And which is why I really wanted to have you on this podcast. I'm already going to cry. But I've just like watched you step so deeply into your own nurturing and like your own heart space, even in your work. And the music industry can be extremely toxic in so many ways. And it can do things to us mentally and physically and creatively that detach ourselves from who we really are. But you have somehow done something that's very different and very special. And so my first question that I, I wanted to ask you was, and I've never asked it of you in this way, but like when was the activist born in you? When was the musician born in you? And when did the two merge? Can you define those moments? Mm, It's a great question. And Rhiannon, thank you for sharing. And what a pivotal, informative time you're going through. Yeah, I can only imagine because I haven't gone through that thing that many of us will experience, most of us will experience. So, And then what you said about the mothering of self, like really resonates with me. I think actually it's very, when you asked me about activist and artist and the the birth of those two types of identities for me, that is actually very intertwined with self-mothering. Music was a way for me to access those feelings of love, acceptance, and safety that I was so hungrily seeking as a child. And I was starting to see that I could give it to myself 
And, you know, I still sought after it in unhealthy ways as a young like teenager and all of that. And I know you and I have talked about that before, but there was this beacon of health that came. And so that's my, I think my artist emerged as soon as I would say even like, as soon as like my traumas were digested in me, the search for comfort birthed my artistry. So she's been, my artist self has been growing probably ever since I experienced my first memories of trauma. And I would say that the activist side started really developing and growing at probably around age nine or 10 because of the different things that I heard what women need to be in order to survive this world. And these things were taught out of love for me because there was so much fear of how like this little girl needs to survive this world. So she needs to learn that she has to be thin. She needs to learn that she needs to keep quiet so that she can be an attractive mate for a male. And so there's just like all these things I learned, but I already was feeling this like resistance to it. And I would speak up against it and I would feel really uncomfortable with those like rules. And I had this internalized conversation and I think it started to emerge then. And then I think the, the, I remember being 14 and flipping through my older sister's magazine, this fashion magazine, and trying to look for an example of how to put eyeshadow on. And I couldn't find an eye that looked like mine, an eye shape or eyelids. And so I remember deciding in my bedroom, like, okay, I want to be part of that change so that in the future, little girls like me will have eyes that look like that in the magazines. And so that I think was the impetus of me realizing like, oh, I can like be a part of the change of all these things I keep hearing from my youth to now about what women need to be. I can be a part of redesigning that. And I would also say the art of redesigning and reimagining something new came from music because I was starting to compose little doodles on the piano. And my piano teacher told me like, okay, this is how you score music. This is how you write the notes. So like I I have like this sheet music of my like seven-year-old sheet music, like chubby little music notes and stuff. And she told me like, okay, now you can title your song. What do you want to name your song? And it was this really important moment for me because I was like, oh, I can name this song whatever I want. And I want to name it something that feels beautiful and what the world could be. And so that action of imaginative, creative activism started then. And so I didn't know how to integrate any of those. And I don't think I was even aware that I was doing all of that. But I do know now that I look back, Music was my way of protesting in my own home because I couldn't speak up. And so I would say all the things I want to say in the songs I wrote. And yeah, and I guess that that's just continued. The protest in my music continues to exist. (laughs) I mean, the way that you speak and the way that you articulate these ideas, it's like you're unlocking something inside of me when I hear it. And the first word that I heard whisper in my ear, as you said, that the little artist in you began to grow at the first experience of trauma, I was like, the alchemist, you're the alchemist. And that's the alchemization of these things that our deepest pains are moments for our greatest growth and expansion and finding ourselves. And that's how I get myself through these days during this like big, big loss is I'm like, what is coming inside of me and on the other side of this? And knowing and trusting that is to know the true essence of life, to know that we are constantly expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting. And everything that you just said there and, you know, to the audience that's listening, like you, Milk, you, Connie Lim, you are one of the most prolific social change artists, musicians of our time, of our generation. You really truly are. And the way that you've been able to navigate these spaces in your own way is what makes you such a powerful leader 
of these times when we actually are being called to do things in a much different way than what was done before. Obviously, we all understand or, you know, the people who are listening to this and and in circles like ours understand that we all want to see system change and we all want to be able to see more equity and more inclusion and a greater connectedness with ourselves and the planet. But instead of shaming what was before, it was a particular marker in time. And just like we don't want to shame the trauma that ended up bringing this part of you alive, which is the most sacred part of you. And that is the design of this, you know, this realm, this earth school. It is designed that way. So when we're watching the most horrific corruption, we know that to witness that and see it and feel it with our eyes is to also transmute it and to understand we want to create something different. It's so powerful. And it was interesting because I was just looking at some of the stuff that you were doing recently. And it was so interesting to see that Forbes had done an interview with you. And it was around the great resignation. Like that was the way that they framed the article. And obviously knowing that so many women are rising up and leaving certain positions. And like I did the same. I sold the economic club and stepped much more fully into what my heart was calling me to do. And you did this too in, you know, leaving the traditional label, leaving all of those and starting to forge your own entrepreneurial path in social change, art and activism and music. And I was wondering, because I know people listening are some still stuck in not knowing how to transition. Some don't believe they can. Some don't know where to begin. So how was that for you? How did that start to bubble up? What, what were some of the challenges and ultimately, you know, what was on the other side of that for you? What what is it? <laughs> mm, yeah, this is a great question. And I love the things you said also about us watching society and wanting something different. It's like shaping us. It's like the chrysalis of a butterfly. My friend saw a butterfly coming out of chrysalis when she was on a hike and she was so excited. So she started thinking that she was helping the butterfly by ripping a bit of the chrysalis so that the, the butterfly could come out easier. And her friend was like, oh no, you've killed the butterfly because every moment of the tearing and the pushing and the and the struggling in the chrysalis helps the wing strengthen. And so by her tearing the chrysalis and allowing the wing to come out, that wing will be lame and the butterfly won't be able to fly. And so it's really interesting because the society we're looking at is kind of like our chrysalis and like we need to break through and all the steps we take to figure out how to struggle out of this will make us into who can exist outside of the chrysalis. So I like love that. And yeah, in terms of the great resignation and my own journey of leaving a major label and deciding that I was going to take a bet on myself, I think it was a very natural kind of organic progression. Basically, my body continued to hold more and more tension to the point that my body couldn't hold it anymore. And I guess I could have pushed through and like, but I think I would have been miserable. So what I've been learning these days is when things feel like they're feeling like a really hard, hard push and nothing is working in concert with me to like accomplish my goal, then I think I need to notice that and then surrender to the gravity that's pushing me in another direction. And I was so tired from trying to prove myself with numbers, with what my income was to justify my business managers, managing my business accounts to justify my music managers, managing my artistry. And I was, I, I got signed to some of the biggest and most like revered machineries in the music industry. And I could feel this pressure of needing to keep up and to prove that I was worth it through these numbers that I just couldn't do because I was also doing a lot of social change work that I cared about. So it it takes up my bandwidth and it also took up the bandwidth of my team. And there's something that I learned is that my lawyer, my business manager, my managers, 
the the bandwidth that it took for them to support me in my journey of doing social change wasn't matching the income I was bringing in. So their measuring stick basically told them like, this is not balancing out because they're looking at numbers like spreadsheet, like, okay. So just like their PNL reports just told them, okay, this is not profitable for us anymore. And so I, I knew that like, as I left, I was like, the profit, the way that this system is defining profit is through like cash and numbers. So my profit is knowing that someone feels better about their life. So they're going to go do a better job in their career, or I'm making a mother feel better about some of the things that she's been struggling with about her own body. And so she's not going to project it onto her daughter. Like that's also profit, but that's not, doesn't show up on the balance sheet. So I was like, I have to, I have to leave this system because it's making me feel really, really small and feel like crap. And so I need to leave this and find, and just like take a bet on myself. And it was scary because I was like, I've been essentially building my own label, hiring a digital strategy team, hiring PR, and I'm investing in myself. Like people invest in stocks, like in companies. I'm just putting that money that I, like there's a moment where I was like, oh man, I wish I could like put money into like real estate or the stock market. But then I heard this really brilliant woman named Brooke Castillo say like, I'm totally into doing all of that investment. But before I do that, I kind of want to invest in me because I know I'm going to, I want to believe that I can turn that $1 into $3 with my own talent, you know? And so for me, I was like, I'm going to just invest in myself and also redefine what dollars means. Like I can just like, or profit means like, it's not just turning $1 into $3 is maybe $1 stays $1, but then like I made two people feel better about their lives. Like, okay, so that's a, that's symbolically profit as well. So now I'm on this journey of self-managing and figuring out how to be an artist with my own resources and like who to partner with. And it's been a really rich journey and it's teaching me so much about myself. And that's all I can really ask for because life in the, at the end of the day is this experience. And my boyfriend talks about life wanted to experience itself. So it fractured itself into humans, animals, all these different things. So it could just like collide and see each other. And so I am part of the universe getting to witness itself. And so now as I like fail, as I succeed, like I'm just getting to witness the universe at work. And that's maybe that's just the whole point. I don't know. I think it's 100% the point. And when we can observe it in that way and like detach in that healthy way where we understand that like I'm witnessing myself in a low, I'm witnessing myself in a high, I'm witnessing myself want to go this direction and then still face a challenge. Like it's not like we make these decisions and then it was all perfect. She did it and then it all worked out and it was never hard again. Like no, and but that's not where the grit comes. It's the choosing yourself, choosing your heart's path, choosing, you know, to value things with multiple currencies which is so new economy and so conscious economics, like you might as well be like reading off the website (laughs) because these things are real currencies and we just haven't valued them. You know, our, our economy and our value system hasn't reflected these currencies adequately yet, but we're on the way. And, you know, that one person seeing themselves, you know, or healing themselves, that changes a generation that comes after to be able to do those things, which changes systems, which changes structures. Like it comes back to how we started this around like the mothering, like, you know, our mothers were broken from, you know, their own situations of parents in wars and, you know, immigrating and and famines and different things. And that generational trauma exists. And then they couldn't show up maybe in the way that 
we needed them and each generation being more evolved and more conscious, literally working its way up the body chakra system. Like we are in the era of the heart chakra now and the heart chakra measures value in a completely different way than the solar plexus, which is all about the egoic, you know, it's, it's who I am. It's the power I have. It's the money in my wallet. But now, you know, the heart, it measures the value in a, in a very different way. And so you were on the cusp of this transition, you know, into this new age before, and and I was too, and it's really uncomfortable when you're breaking through something that, you know, hasn't really, the, the path hasn't been forged. So like when we walk through the woods and there isn't a path, like we're getting branches in our face, we're getting poked in the eye, like we're tasting stuff in our mouth. Like <laughs> there's, there's weird things because that's exactly what it is. And like when I, you know, sold the economic club and, and stepped into this, I was like, oh, now I'm free. But like freedom's scary as fuck. Like that's the truth. (laughs) And then some parts of it, it was like, oh, it was so much easier when this little container was exactly how you operated and you knew what it was. Like in some ways, turning yourself off is easier than being so on and feeling all of the things and learning like, oh, wow, I actually really need to improve on this or that or whatever else. It's, it just is, but it's so, it's so beautiful and like brave and, and gorgeous, really what you've done. And I mean, you're doing big, big stuff and we're going to get into some of the latest projects, but I want to stay on this sort of conversation around currency and money and energetics because you have some really beautiful wisdom and teaching around the energetics of value and and how you started to kind of rework that concept in your own mind. And it sounds like this was like another step in that, like your value wasn't going to be whittled down into like streams on, you know, a particular platform. Like you actually valued yourself more than that to allow that to be your value. So what does that teaching look like for you now that you're on the other side of it? Is there new lessons that you're learning around value, money, energy exchange? And and what is that looking like now? I love this question because I think that I am both on the other side of seeing that these streaming numbers don't define my value and also still living in the system that has streaming numbers. So I feel like I do this like hopscotch between knowing that truth and then dipping back into the world where that is the truth and like streaming numbers are the truth and then going out and being like, but love and justice are the truth and just hopping back and forth and navigating between ecosystems is really interesting. And it means that it goes back to self-mothering is that there's no one thing that is going to hold and take care of me. And that includes these systems like Spotify, all these different streaming platforms are not looking out for me in certain ways. And that is how they are designed. And I have to accept that truth. Like maybe we can build a new system. I think definitely we can. But for now, as we're navigating this and learning, I can go in and put my music on these on these platforms and just be really careful not to you know, snort that cocaine and like get lost in that high of what that is. And Mm -hmm. so I need to just be very disciplined when I walk into these spaces. Like I'm looking for a distribution company, like a company that will help spread my music and put on platforms. I'm looking for deals. And a lot of these companies speak in that language. And so I have to like do a couple of things to stay grounded and stay focused is that I, one, cannot take these things personally, and I I need to take time and slow down to digest how I feel in midst of what these, like, executives are requesting of me if I'm going to go into business with them. I just need to, like, set my own timeline and set boundaries really, really, like, articulately for me. And so I honor what I was just telling my friend is... I had this business conversation with a potential partner and it rubbed me the wrong way and I felt all sorts of feelings and I noticed that. And so I, I didn't say anything, but I I went and I took a day before responding to this email that they sent me. And 
I was like, okay, am I being too emotional? That's the question. And then I was like, no, actually this feeling is telling me something very specific that I need to protect. And so then I gave myself time and I have trusted friends to like talk to. And one of my friends and I, our conversation helped like create the truth or help reveal the truth that was sitting within me that was creating this feeling. So I would look, it was like, oh, there's an imbalance right now in the conversation. And I need to have more agency and more power and dynamic. And so these are the things that I want to request from them in order for me to feel okay with this business conversation. And then I'm going to articulate those boundaries and then they can show up and say, they're going to do this with me or not. And that's kind of a small example of how I'm navigating being both inside and outside of the, I guess the matrix is what we'll call it. And so I think the self-mothering and accepting myself and, and defining myself beyond all these platforms has been really powerful. And I continue to do it as it's a continued exercise, like working out to keep our bodies healthy. It's a muscle because if I forget, like I can sink back into some of the practices of these kind of toxic tech systems, but I can ask myself this particular question, am I serving this platform or is the platform serving me? And that is a very important question I have to ask myself every day. Like when I'm posting on Instagram, when I'm posting on Spotify, TikTok, am I like serving the machine or is the machine serving me? And what does that look like? Because there's a lot of people that tell me lots of rules about algorithms and I'm actively just disagreeing with people and allowing myself to have the space to not be a slave to the algorithm. The Conscious Economics Podcast is brought to you by CPP Investments, manager of the Canada Pension Plan Fund. Canadians can be confident in the fund's sustainability. CPP Investments has earned more than $300 billion in the last 10 years and has more than $500 billion invested around the world. The Canada Pension Plan is set to provide a retirement income foundation for generations to come. To learn more, visit cppinvestments.com. And again, I mean, if you think about it, that is a new currency that has emerged now in this digital social media economy, literally, because that's how we're being judged when we're approaching certain business relationships or anything else. So it really is this new, it's this new equation. And it's just like the old system. You don't want to be at an investment table with someone speaking down to you that's telling you that you have to put your money in X, Y, Z when those things don't align with your values. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so old economy, but it's almost like when we come into these new spaces, even like the crypto space and stuff, I'm just watching like all of these old problems that were in the traditional system just like come over to the other side. It's like, wait a second, like this was supposed to be in in its design. It was supposed to be about like decentralization and, and all of these values. But at the same time, I don't see any people of color around the table. I, there's no women there. Like it's just, and I, I don't want to say no, there are some, but there's just all of this language and, and, and even just the, the way and the tone and the vibration of it all. It just feels like the old thing coming around again. And it's interesting because I don't know what your experience was with that particular business partnership that you were exploring, but what was coming into my mind was a vision of a labyrinth and this idea that sometimes we think because we made a certain decision that we're on a direct new path, but it's interesting how life will circle you back around and it's actually taking you back to the path that you just thought you came off of but you start to come back around and your energy and your feeling sense and your heart and your body will warn you that you are actually going down that path and it could look a little different and all of the things, but it's ultimately going to take you over on that side of, you know, the garden, so to speak. And it's like, how do we, and this is what I'm finding in all of my social change work is that we actually, we know what we don't want so well that we've blocked the visioning for what we do. So it's like, we can't come out of the container. You know, we can't 
create, like, what would it even look like? Like, what would healing really look like? What would, you know, a planetary system of healing look like? What would it feel like? What would it smell like? You know, what would this ideal relationship be? And if it's, if you can envision it, then it is possible. And if this is just not measuring up to that, then like you step out before you even begin, you know, because you've already been there. You've already done that or whatever. And sometimes it's about reasserting boundaries or, or creating the condition where we're back in our power. And sometimes it's about being like, actually, no, like just no right from the get go. Like this ain't yeah. doing it. And it's yeah. just, it's so interesting because we all oscillate between the real world reality of, but I have bills to pay, but I have goals that I want to create, but I have to do this stuff and there's no way. Way. And then all of a sudden our vibration goes up a little and we see the way and it's so much easier. And so whenever I find, and it's actually interesting because I was also listening to a talk this morning about just like physiologically what happens. And this is in particular speaking about women, but when we have too much estrogen, which so many of us do, because there's so many pollutants in our environments and all of these toxins that we're taking in. So a lot of us are estrogen dominant where we're not pulling it out like we should. And what is interesting is one of the symptoms or the side effects of that is this like grasping feeling. Like we've got to grasp for things like, oh my God, I got to lose this 15 pounds. Oh my God, I got to get this thing. I, I, I And like, I'll, I have to do it right away. So I'm just going to have to starve or I'm going to have to go on this cleanse again, or I'm going, well, that didn't work. Like it's that. And I realized I was doing that to myself. Like I have gone through a lot in this last year and I've, one of my ways that I've numbed is with food and sugar and it just is. And so Mm -hmm. I've fluctuated throughout my life with my body and I get so hard on myself, even though I'm trying to embody something else. And I know, you know, in the higher mind, what it's all about, but I still get down in that sink, you know, where you're drowning and you're, and you're going down. And I think that that's exactly it is that sometimes we're so trying to be in our value. And then all of a sudden we slip out of that vibration for just a moment. And it's back to like, I got to pay the bills and I got to do this deal with this thing that doesn't feel that great. Or Mm -hmm. I have to do whatever because I just have to. And this is the challenge of the now. This is the challenge of the bridge generation to the change we're in it. So yeah. it's just so interesting to hear it come up. It's it's really interesting. And I love the, the different examples you brought up of like the slipping back, like from consciousness to maybe a panic or wanting to numb and turn off, like you were saying. And I feel like the, because I feel like those things are so relatable. I feel like many of us are still grappling with, with issues of body and with issues of the myth of this current paradigm or not myth, the imagination that we're living in. Because Sonia Renee Taylor, who wrote the book, The Body is Not an Apology, is like a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant teacher. And she said in one of her IG lives, she's like, look, if you have any type of hierarchical thinking within you about your own body, like, oh, well, thank God I'm not, thank God I have two legs and I can work this way. Oh, oh, well, thank God I'm not, I'm not as big as that other person. Like there's still this like ladder. She's like, until we dismantle these ladders within us, these ladders are going to continue existing and they're going to continue transmuting themselves into any new system. We could go and, uh, you know, go with Elon Musk and build a whole new society on Mars these same things are going to continue because we haven't destructed them within ourselves because we are in that space of reimagining a new imagination. Sonia Renee Taylor says that we are currently living in the imagination that's really been working out for a certain dominant culture and we're doing it. We're continuing to buy into it And she's like, we could just make a whole new imagination. Like we can start practicing and allowing ourselves to do so. And what I think is like, that's a pretty daunting task where it's like, oh my gosh, like how do we do that? And what I'm thinking about a lot lately is like, okay, yes, it's true. Those things are daunting. Like how do we imagine a whole new society? It's like, oh, it just always comes back to me. And the couple tools that I can use to help me be the best version of me so I stop transferring pain onto others and stop perpetuating this fear-based hustle for power is 
there are, two, there are two things. One is noticing, which my therapist gifted me is like, I, I was confiding in her in that, like, I talk very violently with myself at times when I'm working on my career. And she's, and she's like, when you talk to yourself or talk about yourself, instead of saying like, oh, I'm really bad at blah, blah, blah. She says, just say, I'm noticing that I feel like I'm bad at blah, 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 blah. I'm noticing that I feel drained after talking to this person. I'm noticing these things. And so that helps me slow down and just accept reality so that I'm not fighting anymore. I'm not in my head, not running. And then that's already like such a victory. If all of us can just be where our feet are, there's so much that can can change with our relationships and with ourselves and with other people. And then the second thing that is really powerful for me right now, especially the overturning of Roe v. Wade, especially like all these things that have ignited a lot of anger within me is pleasure. Pleasure is such a powerful tool in helping me change the feelings of stuckness, of frustration into this possibility of play. So if we don't allow ourselves to have at least even like a one minute dance party in our kitchen or something that is like accessible to us, but brings us like pleasure. We're not going to have access to those creative, playful parts of ourselves that are childlike that can create this new society we're imagining. So it's not saying get lost in the pleasure and use it to avoid issues. No, it's like an active, healthy pleasure that brings you closer to yourself. Like, cause I know that pleasure of like numbing out so I can get further from myself <laughs> And then I also know the pleasure of those things that bring me closer. Like, am I going to watch this like narrative film that has nothing to do with my life so I can like zone out for a second, which I don't judge? Or do I want to watch a documentary that's like going to like kind of bring me closer to myself and like make me mm -hmm. think about my life, you know? Well, I think that that's so interesting and well put. And yeah, the pleasure, pleasure is not numbing. We've just – we've gotten lost down that road and that is another part of this matrix or this system that we want to get out. That's what was dangled to us. Your pleasure will be when you come out of the toxic work. You know, you are just what you produce and then you can have a small bit of enjoyment where you can buy your way out of whatever it is that you're feeling or you can drink or eat or smoke your way out of whatever it is and you get this tiny little time in the week where that's what you do. And, you know, it's interesting listening to Gabor Mate speak about this idea of, you know, a toxic culture that basically has defined things as normal that are not normal at all, you know? And so it's like we have decided, you know, and accepted that binge drinking on the weekend and going back to work on Monday bloated and exhausted and whatever is normal. And that's called having fun and being young and partying or whatever it is. And, you know, it's like when we're unplugging out of that and, and pleasure is not ever numbing. So it's interesting when we're actually having pleasure. Like if I'm numbing with chocolate, which is something that I do, I'm just cramming it back. Like I'm just going and going. When I'm eating a piece for pleasure, I'm literally tasting every little note on my tongue and I'm letting the, you know, the, it melt and I'm feeling just the sensuality of having it and I'm present and pleasure is present. Anything that's bringing us to presence, not to escapism. So it's just so beautiful. And one of the things that, you know, you just kind of sparked me in thinking about, and it was something I wanted to talk to you about was just getting wiser as women. So aging is another way to say it. I I'm calling it getting wiser. And I'm realizing that like, we just have not had any really great examples in media or pop culture because a lot of the time women were just like shoved away past a certain age. And in particular in the music industry or in, you know, television and news and all of these things, it's like, oh, like, you know, you're past your prime and, and see you later. And you can maybe circle back around when you're like, a, you know, an iconic grandmother age, but like there's this in-between age where we don't want to see you. 
Like if you're a cool granny, you can maybe roll back out and like we'll, we'll, you know, award all of the great things you've done with your life. But it's this in between, like it's basically my age now till whatever. I don't know. Like I probably have like two decades of this in between where it's like the lost abyss of women where it's like we don't, we're not, no one wants to see you go through menopause or no one wants to see these things. It's like we don't talk about them. We don't anything. We just are supposed to come out on the other side and be different. And I just know you get I want to see thought. it. I want to see, see it because I want to learn. Like I, I want to learn. Like, yes. Like, please. Like, I was just talking to my partner about how I remember a specific memory of watching a, a TV talk show when I was in my teens. And they said something very disparaging about themselves. Like, oh, remember the time when we were young and we had a gap between our thighs? Like, oh, those days. Like, oh, if what I would give for that. I listened to that as a 14, 15 year old. And I was like, oh no, I have to keep the gap between my thighs. And it literally affected my posture, how I would stand. And I told my partner today, I was like, I'm standing here and my thighs are touching and it's radical self-acceptance because I have been told for so long, like this fear of getting older, your body changes, like it, that it's, it's something to be feared. And that's such a loss. Like we waste so much energy not accepting reality. And I just am so empowered by being around people who just are fully in their age. And I really want to be mindful of that. I'm 36 and I'm getting to this age where, you know, people talk about like different types of procedures to look younger. And I don't really have a a judgment about it because it's so complex. But I just want it. I want my niece to be spared of the shenanigans that I tortured myself with about these things that are just so natural and actually so beautiful, you know? It's so true. And it's like, this is another thing coming up about in the passing of my mother, like something occurred to me. I'm like, who's going to tell me how to go through menopause? Like, who's going to share with me that information? Because I was like, I never got to ask her that. Like, I didn't get to ask her these things. Like, how'd you navigate this? How'd you navigate that? And the other really like super kind of sad thing, but also an inspiring thing for me when I was going through my mom's home and like getting all of her stuff and don't donating things and whatever. It was like such a, 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 such a warrior time, like to have to go in and do that. But as I was going around, I found all these notes she had around and it was always about like losing weight or like this goal around her body. And I realized how much I metabolized of that and how much that was living in me. And I was like, you know, in the beginning, I'm like, well, I'm going to get really fit this year for my mom then because she didn't get to do it. So I'm going to do it. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, what in the world am I doing? Like, I just, I've oscillated and like, like I said, we're going to go down the wrong path and hopefully the wisdom is that we realize sooner when we're going down it rather than going all the way down and right in the door and like laying in the bed. We just, we realize as soon as our foot hits the, you know, path that it's probably not the way we want to go. But I just think that there is such a wisdom that I've gained with every single, you know, solar return that I have. I, I don't want to go back there to where I came from. Not that I don't <laughs> yeah. you know, love, I don't want to go back there. Like <laughs> my mind's getting way better. My body mm-hmm. may be looking like my boobs could tuck into my waistband. <laughs> I've had two kids, <laughs> but like my mind's such a better place. It's and great. We've got to just, yeah, we, we need more examples of this. And I really want to see more examples in artistry, in pop culture and whatever to see like women and men and and all genders and identities expressing themselves through all ages. And like it, it just – it would be really nice. So Yeah, it would. Ooh, I like that future. I'm like all I feel all good thinking about that future. My my partner, my partner and I have a wider age gap than the average like romantic couple and it's been such a gift for me to learn and to witness him like so gracefully and courageously level up in his life. Like, cause I, I, I talk about age when I, when it's my birthday, I say I'm level 36. I'm going to level up to level 37. Cause what a privilege of being alive, you know, like, yeah. 
And I, I, I think that ageism is, is an ultimate frontier for our society because it's literally everywhere. For Western culture, ageism is rampant and probably comes up. I, can, I witness ageism come up every day. Like every day I witness how we disempower our future selves by judging older as something less valuable. I had a conversation with a family member and she was lamenting like how her body's changing and her eyes and all that. And it's just like, man, what a privilege to be alive. Like, because the mm-hmm. alternate, the alternative is basically death. So like, mm-hmm. I guess if you, you know, but we get to be here and experience it. And Yeah. It's interesting too because that whole piece around the aging or not being valued as you age, like that's the matrix patriarchy capitalist society again because it's Mm -hmm. all about who can work fastest. It's like the factory (laughs) machine, right? It's all about that. And so again, when we push back against these economic systems, we push back by things you would never imagine like embracing your aging body or embracing that you want to operate at a different pace or a slower pace, like praise be. Like these are beautiful things, but it's just like we don't think about those as mechanisms for economic innovation, but they are. Like your thighs touching is economic innovation. Like these are, you know, this is just really, really fun and exciting things. So I'm mindful of the time and I have two last things that I want to ask you quickly. One is just around your own journey with wellness and, and mental wellness. I know we're talking about some, we're basically talking about that through the whole thing, but because it's getting quite toxic even that, like the wellness space and like, Mm. we're well, we're balanced, we're this, Mm. we're that. Like it's also getting a little toxic. (laughs) That's interesting. Yes, because we are still operating in a society with these toxic thinking patterns that are based in competitiveness and power and domination that it will go everywhere and we cannot run from it just like advertisements. They will just follow (laughs) us anywhere we go until we address those issues. And that is what like I learned from my my boyfriend is the ultimate, like when you go to the root of the root of the root of the root of the root thing is that what we've come to, at least someone else might be able to go deeper and please let us know. But what we found is that we've forgotten that like we are a cooperative society and we're cooperative species, but we've actually been taught that we're a competitive species and that we don't belong to each other. That's like that's the myth that we're at and we have to dominate and control. Like it's just going to go everywhere we go. And I forgot your question. So I don't know. Well, it's just was- around like, how do you approach or what's your current philosophy mm-hmm. around self well being or wellness? And do you have any yeah. new things you're doing? Cause you always have cool kind of practices <laughs> and things you're doing. So what are they? <laughs> <laughs> tell us, tell us. I have the privilege of having a a therapist and privilege of thinking about these things. And currently they're very simple little mantras to help me. So one of the things is staying where my feet are, like stay where your feet are and I'll wiggle my toes. If I all of a sudden I I can feel myself like going into a thinking trance and I'm starting to think, 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 then I, I can see, I can feel like I'm like a bubble, like a balloon head. Like I'm just in my head. I'm like, okay, go back to where your feet are. I'm just like here in reality and looking at the objects around me and feeling gratitude for where I'm at. And then the other one, like I said, was the noticing. I'm just noticing I do this. I'm not trying to transform myself overnight. It's like I had a really great athletic trainer and she didn't have me like change my diet and do all these things. She was just like the first two weeks, she was like, I just want you to drink 80 ounces of water. That's it. And it was just this practice of honoring myself by drinking 80 ounces of water. We didn't think about anything else. It was just like this slow, gradual thing. And noticing is the very first step and that's it. Because I have to trust that my brain will then start like coming up with healthier ways as once I acknowledge that I'm doing something in healthy, you know, it's just like, okay, noticing, noticing. The huge thing for me that regulates me amidst my anxiety and I'm on medication for anxiety and depression is one of the things that I do that helps me tremendously is breath work. 
box breathing or some people call it square breathing has been transformative for me. I do it anywhere I go. It's free and it's portable and I breathe in for four. I hold for four, exhale for four and hold for four and just keep doing that. Like even when I'm driving in traffic, I'll do that. It just like helps to regulate and calm me down. And I was just watching that documentary Stutz with Jonah Hill and his Yeah. And I love what he talked about, about the body being like the majority of the tools for feeling better is like just working, working the body, going for a walk, moving, dancing. And so that's really important to me too. I've done a really, really subtle, but tremendous switch in my morning routine where I used to go for the coffee first and then I would maybe work out. But by the time I had my cuddly cup of coffee in my journal, I'm like, eh, maybe not. So now I instead go for a walk or I move my body, I do some stretches and then I'm, and I get engaged with my body and feel a little bit of sweat or feel a little bit of breath. Like my lungs have worked, my heart has beated a little harder. Then I go and make my coffee So I give myself a little bit of time before I go to that wonderful, glorious cup of coffee. And that has shifted so much for me. I can't even, I can't even tell you, I don't know, like I, I, I'm still experiencing the benefits of that. Yeah. I think that's great advice. And I think that when we have that little reward after we've moved and we've sweat, then we enjoy that little cozy moment so much more. And we know we've already done what we needed to do. So I I love that. I love all of those tips and tools and I love how easy and accessible they are. The therapy piece I know is not always affordable for everyone, but I think it's becoming more and more. There's more programs. There's more things that are becoming available for people in order to access some of that self-inquiry, some of that repatterning or reprogramming, which is a lot of the, you know, basis of working with a therapist is to do that. And it's profound. My last is just for you to tell us of some of the cool things and projects that you're doing or that you've just done. Like obviously the We Won't Go Back and all of that is like, please tell us about that project a little bit and then whatever else you want to tell us about. And you were on Netflix documentary and we're just seeing you all the time. We're like, well, there she is again. She's just the coolest. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I, yeah, the We Won't Go Back project started from me simply saying, you know what? I think I'm going to take a lift and go to the Supreme Court the day after the Politico article leaked about a potential overturning of Roe v. Wade. And I had just happened to fly into DC. So I was like, I'm at, I'm at the epicenter right now. So I should go and just like feel it. I really wanted to just like rest and watch Netflix. But I was like, okay, let me just go and see. And I'll just show up. No expectations. I'm not like going to go sing anything. I'm just going to go. So I go and I'm like really inspired and I felt so comforted and energized. And I was like, oh, this is exactly what I needed because I'm with people who are feeling the same way. And that within itself is just so healing. And then there was this chant that people were chanting. I was like, yeah, like it just like leapt out of me too. We won't go back. People were chanting, we won't go back. And I videotaped the whole thing. I went back to my hotel and one of the new things I'm also gifting myself is time to reflect on what I've experienced. I think that is such a luxury, but also so pivotal in changing creative minds is reflection on what has just happened instead of zooming to the next thing. Like schedule in some time to reflect. And so I was reflecting and then I watched one of the videos and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the We Won't Go Back chant. Oh my gosh, this is like a a, a rhythm. I need to like export this audio, put it into my recording software and I'm going to put drums to it and guitar to it. And it just like flowed out of me and I created a song. It's so special. Oh, thank you. I I I pull it out at meetings. I like pull it out. You're going to hear this now. I'm like, look, <gasps> Yay, I'm like, the backtrack you. is the protest. <laughs> it's yeah. the best. It's so cool. It put me into a place of creativity when I felt so powerless. Like I felt so – like I felt like someone took away my power and then me – Using my hands and my ears and my body to create something, it brought me way back into my agency and reminded me, regardless of what that law is, I have my power and no one's going to take it from me. And I wanted to give that to my audience too. I was like, 
get in this with me. Instead of looking at the news, feeling powerless, tell me what you feel or like what you're thinking. And so people submitted their lyrics. And one of the more powerful lyrics of that song is my body is a revolution. And I didn't write that. That was an Instagram fan who sent that to me. And like, it has just transformed the song. It's become like a mantra for everyone that's in the project. Like, oh, our bodies are revolutions. And like the way we treat our bodies, how we can practice the revolution. So it, it's been this beautiful thing. And then we, I invited Ani DeFranco, Autumn Rowe, who wrote like a lot of John Batiste's work with him and produced. So she just won a Grammy for doing Freedom with him. And, and then Bianco, who's this amazing non-binary DJ and producer. And we created this, this piece together. I brought them on. We brought the fans' lyrics on and just became this soup of power and fun and rebelliousness. And so we ended up headlining the Women's March. And then we ended up playing for Hillary Clinton's organization and Hillary Clinton. Um, yeah, it was. And we got to sing with the director of Sister Song, Monica Simpson, who uh, leads Sister Song and that org is basically the org that does the grassroots work that we so admired and we wanted to fundraise for. So that was a really cool full circle moment. She walked on stage with us and sang and she's a singer too. And she was like, I want to integrate my activism and my art. And so it was such an honor to be a part of that like integration for her and to have that song be a part of her art too. But yeah, that, that, that song has been wonderful. And I'm also learning to understand how to like really be just an, my own recording artist beyond movements or in addition to movements. Cause what, what happens for me is like when a movement's happening and I feel passionate, it's like, there's no question. I just release these songs and I'm going with it and I'm first responder mode. And then there's like a whole collection of songs. I don't know how to release because they're about other things that don't have a movement to tie to. So I'm giving myself permission to just be a full human. And so I have an album coming out called Metamorphosis. And I'm currently like, I'm, I'm taking a bet on myself and I'm reaching out to the people that I'm intimidated and slash inspired by and saying like, this is my album. I think it deserves the best. Do you know where I can find a home for it? And I can't tell you how revolutionary that is for me because most of the work that I've done, I have just like not been able to listen to it because there's like something that's bothering me. I was like, ah, like I'm very critical. And so this time around, I'm like, I have followed my truth through every step of this way. And I'm so proud of it, whether or not it's like great music to the critics or whatever, I don't care because I, I like was true to me. So now I have this like new type of like confidence I've never felt before. And I'm going to find the best home for it, the new songs. And I'm really excited. And we have a documentary coming out. PNG studios is doing a story about my journey and, and I'm having such a blast, like coming in at the end of the process, like helping with the story and long form storytelling. Cause I'm also working with La Jolla Playhouse on a musical, which is also long form storytelling. And I'm just learning. I know it's ridiculous. This I'm learning is so much. Wild. About- <laughs> and so special. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm excited to learn more because long form storytelling is like very different from a song, you know, of three and a half minutes of storytelling. So yeah, lots, lots of cool things to come. I'm just like really grateful and just want to keep, keep learning. This is so amazing, so special. My heart is so filled up listening to all of the incredible things that you're doing and so excited for the new album as well. I love all of your music. I always do. It doesn't have to be just about, you know, a, a certain activist movement, like everything that you write and everything that you do is so special, your voice, your talent, and you are just so wise. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I will link where to find you and everything for all of our listeners so that you can check out Milk and follow her amazing journey. And yeah, we'll we'll talk to you so soon. Mm-hmm. 
I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I enjoyed recording it and having that conversation. If you want to find out more about Milk, we're going to link her website and and some of the projects that she mentioned uh, below in the show notes. And if you are part of our community and you want to come out and be a part of an activation, this month we're doing a really cool activation at Art House in Toronto for Black History Month. We have some amazing artists and speakers lined up. And if you are local, I encourage you, go to our website, check it out. Most of our events are free of charge to attend. Um, We're usually a little limited on capacity, kind of a first come first serve. So either check out our website or follow us on Instagram for all of the updates on what's next. And thank you so much for tuning in. I do hope to, you know, meet more of you. And thank you so much for the incredible response to the podcast this season. We have a few episodes coming up that are um, really going to be inspiring and exciting, just like this one. So keep tuning in every two weeks, uh, new economy style. I'm getting better this week. So I hope I don't sound like this the next time you hear me. Have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your week and we will see you next time on the Conscious Economics Podcast. Bye for now.